loud noises, terrible smells, grand lords and ladies, endless servants, fierce knights and juggling jesters. Don't be fooled by all the films that portray medieval castle life as an embarrassment of riches. Primarily built in England and Wales after 1066, castles cemented the new system of feudalism, where people worked and fought for nobles in exchange for loyalty, protection, and the use of land. As a fortress as well as a home, a medieval castle was effectively a symbol of the Lord's power and, with its hierarchy and festivities, represented a cross-section of medieval life more widely. But what was life really like in a medieval castle? Was it really as lavish and luxurious as we're sometimes led to believe, or was it cold, dark, and difficult? Let's find out. This is History Rediscovered, to support please subscribe, the castles were stinky smelly. Maybe it's because of the bench toilets, or the usual lack of hygiene among the lower classes, but castles smelt pretty horrible. Also, the lack of privacy provided by the restrooms and the fact that there was only a cesspool for waste disposal did not help. Cleaning oneself wasn't always simple because the serving classes frequently had less access to fresh water and bathtubs. Furthermore, sickness was prevalent among the lower classes, and while the wealthy could easily afford the best medical care, the average castle dweller would have to rely on herbal medicines, if anything at all. A typical castle could house over 100 people. If you are not a people person, then maybe living in a castle wouldn't have been for you, not that anyone really had a choice. And the layout of a typical medieval castle tended to be influenced by domestic needs rather than defensive concerns. For an average-sized castle in England, you could expect around 100 to 150 people to live alongside the Lord's family. These would have included servants such as cooks and gardeners, grooms and horsemen, as well as educated employees, who could read and write, to manage the finances of the Lord's estate. The focus of domestic life in a medieval castle would have been the Great Hall, which was a common feature to almost every castle in England. Most of the people who lived there in the castle would sleep in the Great Hall, and literally made their bed out of straw-filled linen sacks every night. This large hall was the focus of hospitality, celebration, and the pleasures of life in a medieval castle e including dances, plays or even poetry recitals. A medieval feast would have included unimaginably rich foods e even roast peacock, all loaded onto huge wooden tables. Seating in the great hall was according to each individual status. The most important people would have been seated on a raised dais at the head of the hall, positioned above everyone else. If you were less important, though, you'd be seated by the exit doors on the wooden benches at the back of the hall. To be given the cold shoulder, was to have been served the last slice of a spit-roasted animal, thus be last in the order of guests. At the top is the king, everyone below him owes him. He gained support of those immediately below him by providing land to hold and the people who belonged to all lived on the earth. The lords are on the next level. They too might live in castles, but theirs would be smaller and probably a tad less defensible than royalties. If a lord rebelled, the king wanted to be able to take the castle, they vowed loyalty and military service to the king. The lords promised food, protection, and shelter to the next level. The next to the last level is the knights. To their lords, they owed homage asterisk and military service, the peasants or serfs are at the last level. They were the lowest in every respect, they received little. This level represented the majority of the population, their responsibilities were to farm the land and pay rent. No glass in their windows and no flushing toilets. Medieval castles were made of thick stone walls. Although stone was a perfect material for creating strong, defensive fortifications, medieval building techniques were basic. This meant that most structures could only support tiny windows, which resulted in dark rooms that were constantly cold, as the thick stone could never be fully warmed by the sun. Inside castles, there was little natural light. Since glass was not widely made until the 17th century, it was very expensive. Little light holes in the walls were required to prevent excessive wind and drafty air from entering. Instead of windows, a castle's defense towers, often known as turrets, contain small openings. They serve the twin functions of letting light in and enabling archers to fire arrows at the opposition. In actuality, not everyone resided in a castle permanently. The lack of sewers and running toilets was the biggest issue of living in a medieval castle, but there were other issues as well. The moat that surrounded the castle was frequently utilized as a sewer. The moat and the castle soon became foul-smelling and filthy. According to legend, the kings and queens of England never stayed in one of their castles for more than eight weeks due to the development of bad odors. Their castles would be abandoned for the remaining ten months of the year, aside from basic protection, to allow Mother Nature to naturally purify the structure. Yet, there were heavy tapestries draped on the walls and floors when the royals were residing there, 
they provided a lot more warmth and absorbed much of the moisture in the air. During a few brief weeks, a castle could be a relatively nice place to live if there were roaring fires and a lot of people walking around. Late medieval developments in architecture and Gothic castle design did improve on these problems, though, and castles built in the late 1200s began to have larger windows and lighter rooms. Incredibly, fireplaces weren't invented until the middle of the medieval period. Until this time, all fires were open fires, which didn't spread heat so effectively, and generated a lot of smoke. How clean were medieval castles on a daily basis? It was incredibly challenging to maintain castles tidy. Simple washing duties required transporting numerous bucketfuls of water from a well or stream because there was no running water available. The community was typically more tolerant of odors and grime because few people had the luxury of being able to take regular baths. Straw and grass with a lovely scent were frequently spread around the flooring. When it became filthy, it could be swept away and replaced. It also had the benefit of covering up other, more repulsive smells. Tapestries were frequently hung on walls to cover chilly masonry and warm up and cozy up spaces. You shared your space with rats. Rats are among the many awful creatures that thrive in conditions that are dark, wet, and chilly. Thus, by default, if you lived in a castle, you did so with rats. Rats were very common in medieval times, so castle residents may have grown accustomed to living with them, but they were typically still scared of them. Rats were one of the simplest and most efficient means of medieval torture, and their beady eyes always struck fear into the hearts of their reluctant housemates. How did castles fight mold? They didn't, is the short answer. In medieval times, mold, insects, rodents, and sickness were commonplace. Fresh water was expensive, and a trustworthy disinfectant hadn't yet been found. When compared to actually obtaining enough food to eat or fending off ravenous wild predators like wolves, eating a small amount of mold on your meal or sleeping in quarters with moldy walls were minor inconveniences. Individuals in Norman and Tudor England lived brief lives, 40 was the traditional retirement age. Privacy was limited in the bedrooms. A typical bedroom today might be a place of privacy, but that wasn't the case in a medieval castle. The sitting room in the medieval bedchamber was where visitors were welcomed and amused. Private, essentially meant something more akin to, exclusive. Imagine it as a gathering spot for the lady of the house and her closest friends. It's typical for medieval castles to only feature a handful of bedchambers, and those were exclusively used by the noble family. Knights, soldiers, servants, and even visitors might sleep on the benches and tables in the great hall, and the luckiest might score a spot on pallets filled with straw. Everyone else was left to fend for themselves. Every man, woman, and child had their own space to sleep because there were no established sleeping arrangements. And in the winter, the best seats in the Great Hall were those that were close to the fire. Another interesting fact, did you ever wonder if people were simply shorter in medieval times when you saw a little bed? The small beds were not necessary due to that, rather, many people preferred to sleep upright. Why? The belief that lying flat was a position reserved for the deceased. Oh my god, the bathrooms were so, 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 squick. It's simple to take modern comforts for granted, but here's an interesting fact. Castle bathrooms during the Middle Ages were far from luxurious. These were more frequently referred to as the guardrobe or the privy, according to ancient history, but there are also accounts of other euphemisms. Several castles gave it the amusing names of the Golden Tower and the Necessarium, respectively. The most typical design was a chamber constructed outside a castle wall. They would just sit over the holes, conduct their business, and then let it fall to whatever was below. If it wasn't possible to place the guardrobe over a river or a moat, they would usually empty into cesspits, which would occasionally be cleaned out by farmers who would utilize the contents as fertilizer. The more guardrobes there were, the larger the castle would be, and anyone who need complete privacy to do business might not be in luck. Certain castles had guardrobes constructed with several apertures so they could hold a number of people at once. Yes, it reduces line waiting, but at what cost? Rushes and herbs were used to cover the vast amounts of food grease and animal waste on the floors. Reeds and herbs would be scattered all over the flooring in an effort to attempt to maintain the castle's semblance of cleanliness and freshness, an ongoing losing battle. This was done so that as the typical castle day progressed, the liquids, and solids, that came its way might be absorbed and contained by the dry grass. When the rushes were cleaned up and fresh ones replaced, an ancient collection of beer, oil, pieces, bones, spittle, excrement of dogs and cats and everything that is nasty would be exposed. The herbs did their best to mask the stink that was inevitable as a result of all that foulness. Food was a big deal. Several people had full-time jobs feeding the residents of a medieval castle and it wasn't cheap. 
consider Joan de Valence's home. She spent almost 40% of her entire salary on feeding her family. Several employees were also engaged to handle all the food preparation and cooking. According to castles and manor houses, many medieval castles also had pantlers, in charge of the pantry, which contained items like bread and cheese, confectioners, poulterers, and even spices. They too worked non-stop. According to ancient history, there were often three meals offered during the day, beginning with a breakfast that usually consisted of only some bread and wine. The following meal was the largest and the third meal of the day was also small. The largest meal was typically served between 10 and noon. Dining would be invited to the grand hall by the blowing of a horn, and yes, they would wash up first. Diners were typically served in pairs, and it was the lower-ranking person's responsibility to cut the bread or the meat. Table etiquette were also very important. It was requested that diners refrain from burping, keep their elbows off the table, and not place their own utensils in shared dishes. 